we're going to bring on uh, the, one of the authors from the book, Go For Now, an amazing concept. They're touring all, you know, working with companies all over the country. They work with all the, some of the top networking companies out there. So we know the concept is tried and true. And let me tell you, since we've been working on it, our exposure level definitely is up on my organization and in all of our organizations since we've embraced the concept. But now we're going to hear from the author so we can take it to the next level. I am excited to introduce Andrea Wall. Hi, Andrea. How are you? Hey, I am doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having us. And I've got Richard Fenton with me as well. Hey, how are you? Hi, Richard. How are you? (laughs) Wonderful. Thank you. I got to tell you, I love the book. We, me and Tupac and the family, our whole family who's in the business, we're excited about it. We've talked about it. We went back and forth, and then we've been sharing it with everybody in Five Links who will listen to us. So it's exciting to have both of you in this call, and I'm going to turn the call, call over to both of you. We're about 500-plus right now and growing, and I expect a packed line today so we could get this wonderful information from you. Great. Well, listen, we are always thrilled uh, to be on the phone with people who are excited and excited about building their business, and we're especially excited about sharing um, information about our favorite word in the whole world, the word no. (laughs) Right. Now, some of you may find that a little strange, uh, but we see no in a totally different way than most people. We have learned that by harnessing the power of no's, you can actually reach a greater level of sales success by only focusing that, then just by focusing on the yeses in your business. Now, we know everybody loves yes, and most people hate no's, right? At best, they tolerate the no's. Well, this morning, we're going to be talking with all of you about turning the no's we encounter in our business from obstacles, right, things that slow us down or stop us, into assets. And this is a process You could say it's a mindset. Uh, It's also a strategy that we call go for no because we like to say that no can actually be the most empowering word in the world. And quite frankly, you know, what if you could achieve every quota and hit every income goal and reach every personal dream you have by simply learning to hear no more often? Well, Richard and I think that you can. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is that as kids we weren't faced at all when we heard the word no. You know, we shrugged it off, we laughed at it. I mean, we simply ignored it. But somewhere along the line, this natural sense of tenacity that we're born with tends to get lost, or even worse, it gets drummed out of us. Now, just in case um, you're thinking, oh, boy, this sounds like it's going to be a lot of rah, rah, motivational stuff, um, let us assure you it isn't. Um, Over the time that we um, have with you this morning, we are going to share a few uh, what we call core go for no concepts that can start impacting your results immediately. And when we say immediately, we're not talking about next week, next month, or next year. We are talking about, like, this afternoon. (laughs) Absolutely. So here's the first question we want you to ask yourself, and that question is, when you hear the word no, what does that no mean to you? In other words, how do you respond to a no internally in your mind? What do you say to yourself? I mean, is that the moment where where you say, wow, I'm not going to get anywhere today, I don't have what it takes, I hate trying to get people in the business. I'm, I'm bad at prospecting or networking, you know, all of that negative self-talk. Um, I can't be successful in this business. Or do you respond positively, and are you able to avoid all of that negativity? And also, how do you respond externally in your actions? What do you do when you get a no or a series of no's? Um, do you stop for the day? Do you get involved in other tasks and let the entire day go, you know, without making another call or another contact? You know, some people go a week or a month. Do you avoid networking situations? You know, there's all these things that we do in our activities because we hate putting ourselves in the position of hearing no and being rejected. Well, so we asked we asked the question, how do you respond? Because it's really telling and it's so critically important because your response to rejection, in this case the no's that you encounter, is the thing that ultimately spells the difference between long-term success and failure for millions of people all over the planet. And Rich and I believe it's not age or gender or training or skill, um, not the product or service being offered. Right, it's not the economy either. Right, right? nothing else but this. The relationship you have with the word no, and 
you may not know you have a relationship with the word no, but you do. <laughs> so what you think and feel when you hear it, how you internalize it, how you respond to it, and what you do afterward as a result. In other words, whether you seek opportunities to hear more no's or whether you then start running away from them, metaphorically, is one of the single most important factors in determining the level of success that you will achieve. We're going to help you do that. We can help you reprogram this entire process. So we want to go out on a ledge here and say that if you are not currently achieving the level of success you want in your life, you are probably not failing, that is, hearing no often enough. Now, um, because Richard and I are known as the go-for-no people, everyone assumes that we must somehow be so fearless. And the good news is <laughs> nothing could be further from the truth. We've, just, we've, we've worked this stuff, and you guys can too. We've learned how to change our mindset. So we're going to lay a little foundation before we get into the core concepts that you guys can use in your business immediately. Rich needs to tell a couple stories um, that may be a little familiar to you, and uh, he'll, so he'll kick us off. Sure. Well, I have to tell you, I started my career in business working for my father in the automotive industry, and I had been working for him for a couple of uh, months, and suddenly I found myself failing miserably. I mean, just as bad as you can imagine. I knew I had to do something, so I had to go back to my dad, and you have to imagine how difficult this was. Here's a 20-something son going to his sales legend father and having to actually say, I can't sell, right? Well, my father took it extremely well. He said, you know, Rich, he said, you're right. He said, I've never really given you any sales training. Um, he said, come on in here. Let's make some calls together. Well, let's make some calls together really meant that he was going to make some calls, and I was going to sit on the other side of the desk, and I was going to listen in because this was in a pre-speaker phone era. So I only got to listen to you know, one half of the conversation, right? Well, my father grabs his phone book. He flips to the rent-a-car section, and he says, you know, here we go, ABC rent-a-car. I've never called on these people before. Let's give them a call. Well, my dad dials the phone. He gets the purchasing agent on the phone. And Leslie, Tupac, I have to tell you, in three minutes, he gets an order for 20 cars. And that was the moment that I decided that I was going to quit the car business because I knew that I could never do what I had just watched my father do, or at least I didn't think I could, right? Well, you see, my father was one of those quintessential sales naturals. He was somebody who could start a conversation with anyone, anywhere, anytime about anything. You know, he had no fear or hesitation at all. Um, well, you know, in, in reality, in this regard, I am not my father's son. Right, so you may be thinking that this is the point where Rich really turns it around and dug in and worked really hard and conquered his fear of selling, right? Uh, no, not so much. <laughs> the, the, the truth is um, I did quit my job. Uh, I quit my job. I moved from Los Angeles all the way to, um, from Chicago, I should say, all the way to Los Angeles um, to get as far away from selling as I possibly could. And uh, interestingly, the first job I took was in sales. But this time I took a job in retail sales because I thought in the world of retail I wouldn't have to go out and prospect for customers. It would be easier because people would just be coming into me, right? Well, the truth is it didn't make any difference. Um, I still found myself failing. Now, for all of those who have already read the book, Go For No, the story I'm going to tell here might be just a little bit familiar because the story in the book, Go For No, um, that the character experiences is really my story. Uh, it's the story that actually happened to me. I had been working in this new job for about two months. Um, as I said, I wasn't doing that well, um, and that's really an understatement. My sales were so abysmal, I was pretty sure they were going to fire me, and that's when I heard that the, the district manager, a man by the name of Harold, was scheduled to visit the store, and I thought, you know, maybe if I could just impress this guy, you know, um, Harold, you know, when, when he comes in the store, uh, they'll give me a chance to improve my sales, right? Well, Harold shows up at 9.30 in the morning. We had donuts and coffee. The store opened up at 10 o'clock, and I got to help the first customer who walked in, and in walks this well-dressed gentleman who immediately announces that he wants to buy an entire wardrobe of clothing. And I thought, wow, here it is. This is it. This is my magical moment to impress Harold and show him how great I can be. And sure enough, within half an hour, I've got an $1,100 sale on my hands. I'm really proud of myself, and I'm, I'm just absolutely certain that Harold's going to be blow, you know, blown away. Well, Harold finally you know, throws me a bone, and he says, you know, hey, that was, a, you know, that was a pretty good sale, kid, but let me ask you a question. He says, the question I want to ask you is, what did that customer say no to? And I have to tell you, I got you know, thrown 
off a little bit. You know, I, I said, what's he talking about? And I hadn't realized in that moment that he had just asked me a question that was going to change the course of my life. And when I stopped being defensive and I really thought about what he just asked me, and I, I, I you know, reviewed the sale in my mind from beginning to end, I realized that that customer had not said no to anything. They said yes to everything I showed him. The man bought everything I showed him. I said, Harold, the customer didn't say no to anything. And then Harold asked me the other really important question. He said, then how did you know he was done? Well, I'm going to tell you how I knew he was done. You see, I was a young kid. I wasn't making a lot of money. You know, I didn't have, I didn't have a fat wallet. I didn't have an unlimited budget. I had never gone into a clothing store in my life and spent, you know, $1,000 on myself on clothing, right? So when a customer got to $1,000, they were done. I would shut the sale down, ring them up, and send them on their way. Harold said, you know, Richard, I watched you sell. And he said, you know what, kid? He said, you're not half bad. But then he said, your fear of the word no is going to kill you. But, he said, if you can get over that, he said, I think that you could become one of the great ones. Well, it was amazing because I went into work that morning thinking they might fire me, and I went home that you know night um, fired up, if you will. I went home that night two letters from greatness, and the letters were N-O. That's why we're so excited about the word no. Now, while this is my story, I'm pretty sure that I'm not alone here. It is very likely that my story is, at least to some degree, um, the story for many of you who are listening to this call. And if it's not your story, it most certainly is the story of some of the people you have on your team or people who you will have on your team in the future. Absolutely, because most people spend their careers seeking success, the yeses, because that's how we've all been taught and trained, while doing everything within their power to avoid failure, to avoid hearing no. Um, Ironically, that is a recipe that ensures mediocre performance, intentionally increasing your failure rate. And by that we mean intentionally increasing the number of times people say no to you is the ultimate strategy for achieving the long-lasting sustainable success we're talking about because when you go out of your way to increase the number of no's you hear the yeses will show up at your door um, in greater quantities and more stress-free we'll talk about that in a a minute than you ever could have imagined you know um, before that moment with my um, you know sales situation with Harold I had operated using a mental model that had me in the middle uh, and it had success, you know, having people say yes to me on one end, and it had failure, in other words, having people say no to me on the other end. And I thought it was my mission in business, I mean in life for that matter, to do everything within my power to move towards success and have people say yes to me and simultaneously to do everything within my power to move away from failure and to avoid having people say no to me. But what Harold got me to understand that day is that there was a second model, uh, quite frankly, a much more effective model. Harold said, Richard, the way that you should be thinking is you are on one end of the model with failure and rejection and having people say no to you in the middle. And this success that you want so desperately, that is on the far end of the model. He said failure and rejection and hearing the word no, these are not things that you're supposed to be avoiding. These are things you're supposed to be seeking because no, right, is the stepping stone on the road to success. Put another way, what Harold kind of taught me, you know, that day was that, um, and this has become the, really the subtitle of our book, yes is the destination, but no is how you get there. Harold, you know, made an interesting analogy. He said, you know, most people when they're driving down the road, if they saw a sign marked failure, they would assume they're heading in the wrong direction. And, of course, when you think you're heading in the wrong direction, what do you do? You stop, you turn around, and you go back. You've got to figure that you know, if, if failure is straight ahead, well, success must be behind you. He said, it's not. He said, when you see the sign marked failure, when people start rejecting you, when, you know, the, the, when things get tough, when people start saying no to you, he goes, you don't quit and go back, he says, because success is almost always straight ahead. Exactly. So what we're trying to tell you guys here is the number that really matters in business and in your life is your NQ, uh, not your IQ. <laughs> this is your NQ, your no quotient. It's the number of times you are willing to hear no before succeeding, before getting what you're after. It's the number of times you are willing to get knocked down 
and then get back up knowing full well that you are probably going to get knocked back down again. That is the number that determines greatness in today's world and really perhaps the only number. Again, it's not IQ because the history of the world's greatest people, the movers and shakers and doers and the people in your business who are walking across the stage and getting the awards and the recognition and the accolades, these are not people who sit alone and don't share their story and don't hear a lot of no's. Believe me, they hear a tremendous amount of no's. They, they're just people with high NQs. They're, all the, the great people have you know, stories of uh, tenacity and high no, quotient, um, high no quotient background. So the idea here is to start living in a go-for-no world where you see no differently. It can make things a lot more fun. It can make things a lot more empowering, and that's the goal. Uh, it's not about suffering through the nose. It's about changing your mindset and adopting that model of failure and success so that when you get the nose, which are inevitable, and obviously we don't sugarcoat that, right? We're not trying to say that re- rejection isn't out there because it is, but it's how you deal with it. Um, you can turn it around and you can make it empowering. So um, we are so glad that I think so many of you have read the book. That's fantastic. After we wrote it, um, which has been many, many years now, we created uh, something called Mastering Go For No, and it's a three CD, um, actually technically I guess four, four CD training program. On the three CDs is Richard and I talking for about three hours of about 20 core Go For No concepts. We looked at every nuance. We looked at every mindset idea. We looked at every tactical strategy, and so we developed this program, and then we created a, a personal implementation guide that goes with it. So what we're going to do today, this morning, is we've picked out a couple of our favorite concepts that we we know will work the best for you, and that's what we're going to cover next. So, Richard, this, let's talk about the first one. Okay, yeah. Um, let's start with core concept number nine from the uh, audio CD program, and that is that having yes goals is important, but having no goals is critical. Right. Now, we allude to this idea of no goals in the book, and you all know, I'm sure you are all pretty good goal setters. We all know how important it is to set goals. The challenge is that sometimes, you know, is in the type of goals we set. Most of us operate with what are commonly called yes goals. You know, they're goals for the number of times people say yes to us, how many dollars we generate, how many sales we make, how many people we add to the team. And this approach, while we've all been taught and trained to follow, does have a little flaw. And the flaw is that once we achieve that goal, or even sometimes as we get near to achieving that goal, we tend to divert our attention to other tasks, right? But what do we do? How do we divert our attention? Well, we reward ourselves for our success. Um, how do we reward ourselves? Well, we slow down. We take time off. We maybe go play golf, go to a movie, go shopping. Or if you're still working in your business, you just, get, you just allow yourself to get involved in all the non-sales-oriented tasks, like catching up on paperwork and doing other things. So there is a better approach that can dramatically increase your performance, and that is to stop setting typical yes goals um, and we don't mean don't have a vision, don't have those that, that vision board and all of that, but we say stop focusing just on those yes goals and start setting a no goal instead. Right. In other words, we're saying to stop setting goals exclusively for the number of sales you intend to make or the number of people you intend to recruit and add to your team, yes. right, all, all, the the, yeses. Yeah, all of the yeses, and to start setting a goal for the specific number of times that you intend to get people to say no to you. Now, what we're talking about here really is to start operating with a failure quota in addition to simply having a success quota. Yeah, so it does require a little shift in thinking, especially for those of you who are really focused on being good goal setters and good goal achievers. So, um, but when you do this, your results can be immediately can be immediate. So when we first launched our business, I always give this example because we, we did it ourselves. And, and in our case, we had a goal of yes goal of about four. Our goal is to speak about four times a month. So we would get on the phone, we'd start calling and sending packages and sending emails and following up. And sometimes we'd get lucky, you guys, and we would book all of book our four yeses the very first week. So what do you think we did with the rest of the month? Well, <laughs> Richard and I, we lived in LA, so we'd go to the movies, we laid by the pool. And then one day we had an epiphany. We said, you know, we're teaching, starting to teach people this go for no concept, but we're not doing it. We're not living it 
with these no goals. So we decided to change the way we set goals in our own business, and we started setting no goals instead. And so we decided to get 100 no's. Um, and we were selling to businesses, so we wanted 100 companies to say no to us each month. And when so- someone said yes to us, we didn't just stop and celebrate and, and then stop for the day. We had to keep going, actually, to hit our no goal. And that was the difference. And what was amazing is that we found in any month in which we were hitting our no goal, we ended up with more business than we knew what to do with. And whenever things would slow down, we'd have a lean period, we could look back a few months on the calendar and discover a month that we had not been hitting our no goal. Right. And that's the insidious thing about having you know, what we call these yes goals. Right. Sometimes when you have a yes goal, it ends up limiting your performance rather than driving it upward. Because when you hit the yes goal, you tend to slow down and stop, like Andrea just said. But you see, when you stay focused on the behaviors necessary to be successful in your business, and I will tell you the singular most important behavior to be successful in your business is to set and hit a no goal, you will find that the yeses will come. They will come automatically. And more excitingly, they will come um, more stress-free. They always do. Can you just talk about that for just a second, the stress-free aspect? The stress-free aspect? Well, you know, if you, if, you th- if, you think of, if you think of the idea that when you're trying to get a yes and your entire conversation with a customer is like pressing them and pushing them and trying to get the yes, I mean, you, cr- you put a tremendous amount of stress on yourself to get the yes, and you're also putting the same amount of stress and pressure on the, on the prospect, which interestingly ends up with them saying no. Now, if you were to invert it and just say, I'm going to present my product, I'm going to present the service, I'm going to present the opportunity, and I'm going to go into this situation understanding and accepting the idea that no is a perfectly acceptable answer. Not only is it a perfectly acceptable answer, but you've got a goal for the number of no's that you want to get for that week or that month. And so even if they say no, you've accomplished something and made progress in your business. When you do that, it's like, it's like all the stress gets released from your body. You're no longer pushing. You're no longer pressing. And the greatest irony of the world is that when you let this stress and pressure go and now you're relaxed, you'll find that the people you're selling to are more apt to say yes. It is really one of the most ironic, interesting, interesting and fascinating parts of, of the business world that we've ever found. Absolutely. And that kind of brings us to um, core concept number four. Uh, Andrew, is that a good yep. one for us? Okay, that I'd like to talk plan. about from the um, program, and that is that you need to focus on quantity first and quality second. Right. Specifically what we're talking about here is the quantity and quality of your sales and your opportunity type presentations. Right. Quantity, of course, refers to the number of people who you are going to approach with your story. Well, quality refers to how well you explain the features and benefits of the of the products and services and the business opportunity. Right. Now, listen, it's important for Andrea and I right now to make sure that we, we, that we, we communicate to you that we're not trying to discount the importance of doing a quality presentation, right? It's important to do a great presentation when it comes to influencing others and achieving success in your business. But there's another reality, and that reality is that the number of presentations that you make. The number of doors you knock on. Right. The number of people that you attempt to recruit. In other words, the number of shots you take is significantly more important than how well or how perfect you do it. Right. Now, because I kind of started out telling you this embarrassing beginning in my, in my sales career, failing, working for my father, let me tell you another little aspect of my time with my dad. Um, when I first started in the car business, I noticed that my father had a piece of masking tape stuck to the back of his telephone receiver. And on it, he had written three words. Now, if you happen to have a pen and a piece of paper near you, um, and I imagine that most of you are pretty serious students of success, so you probably do, Mm -hmm. and if you're only going to write down three words during the time that we have together, um, other than go for no, I guess, um, these are the three words you should write down. On the back of my dad's telephone receiver, he had written the words, unseen, untold, unsold. Unseen, untold, unsold. Well, being new to the business of sales, I asked my father, you know, what what does that mean? And he said, Richard, selling is nothing more than telling your story to as many people as you can as fast as you can. He said, if prospective customers remain unseen and untold, 
He said they will forever remain unsold. Well, I mean, let's face it. It just, it just doesn't get any simpler than that. The point that we are trying to make here is that the best, most perfect sales presentation, the best approach in the world, the one that you wordsmith, right, and practice and role play for hours or days or weeks or, God forbid, months, is completely wasted when you don't deliver it. While the worst stuttering, stammering, unfilled, screwed up sales presentation in the, in the world has a chance to create magic. See, it doesn't matter how smooth you are with your presentation or whether you can answer every question or every objection that somebody throws at you. What matters is that you tell your story to as many people as you can as fast as you can. My father, I should mention, was the number one seller of General Motors product in the company's history. And what he did not say to me was that you had to be perfect or that the quality of your presentation had to be exactly perfect. He said, tell as many people as you can as fast as you can. Tell them your story, and those who want it will take it, and those who don't won't. Now, we're willing to go on a little bit of a limb here, and we're going to suggest that you could approach people, and you could say, you don't want to know about five links, do you? And you know what? Some people are going to go, I don't know. You know, what's, what's five links? And suddenly you are going to find yourself in a conversation about your product and your service, and that really is the only goal. Yeah. Now, obviously, we're not recommending that approach, but no. it's a great mm-hmm. example that to, you know, to make the point that the worst presentation that is delivered is infinitely better, Rich said it, than the perfect presentation that's never delivered. Perfection is a killer of progress. And the problem is that many people spend so much time preparing and working on their approach that they never get around to approaching anyone. Somehow they're never quite ready enough. Well, the best way to perfect the quality of your approach is to increase the quantity of people you approach. Right. And, and when you do that, what you find is that you're letting the SW, 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 SW principle work for you. And, you know, what all those SWs stand for, for those of you who haven't heard this before, is some will, some won't, so what, someone's waiting. Yep. So let me break it down. Some will. You're going to make your presentation. They're going to like what you have to say, and it's going to be easy. We love those, sure. (laughs) But some won't, no matter what you do. Well, so what? This is where your response to the no comes in. This is where your attachment to the outcome, in this case your attachment to the yes, needs to become so what? That's okay. And immediately after that, someone's waiting. Now, the idea of someone's waiting is really important because but here's the question. Is somebody waiting? Do you have a list of people that you've spoken to? Those, those are someone's waiting, those past no's, um, who maybe weren't ready, who weren't maybe all that interested, who were nervous because, you know, what, you, know you, you hear all the objections and all the excuses, right? Do you have somebody's card you got a week ago that you haven't called back? You have a list of happy customers. You could get referrals. Well, of course you do. There's always someone waiting, even if they don't know it. They might not know they're waiting, but they are waiting. <laughs> they're waiting for you. <laughs> However, the problem is that most of the time, because we live in a go-for-yes world, meaning we're always operating in a way that has us avoiding situations where we could be rejected, we don't look at the someone's waiting list. We avoid it, or we be Come complacent, waiting for the easy phone call, the person who falls into our lap rather than getting out there making someone's, you know, something happen in your business. So take the someone's waiting list seriously. Make an effort to create a list of those people. And when you do get that no, you have a far less emotional reaction, a toxic or bad negative reaction, right? That's that response to no because you know you have opportunities right around the corner. It's important to focus on that, that there are people waiting, um, that you've got to keep going quickly and move to the next person who is out there with a need for what you have, even if they may not know it mm-hmm. yet. Yeah, that's good. And that really brings us to um, our next really important concept, and that is that no doesn't mean never. No means not yet. Now, my guess is that there's always some people on the call, especially when we have this many people on the call, who are people who love numbers. Um, I'm a numbers guy, so I understand. I think you'll find these numbers very interesting. Um, I want you to consider these selling statistics. 44% of all people give up after hearing no one time. They will approach somebody with their product, their service, their opportunity. They make the presentation. The person tells them no. And what they do is they interpret that no to mean never. They assume that that no means that this person will never buy from me. This person will never become a part of my team. 44%. 
22% more give up after the second no. 14% more give up after the third no. 12% more give up after the fourth no. Now, if you're doing the math here, 44, 22, 14, 12. This means that 92% of all people will give up before getting a fifth no from somebody that they've approached with their product, their service, or their opportunity. And yet the same research project that this came from showed that 60% of all people who will eventually become your customers or join your team will say no four times before they finally say yes. So, you know, we all find ourselves asking the question, how do I get in the top 8% of salespeople? How do I end up being the person who's going to walk across the stage getting the award? How do I get the cars and the trips? How do I get the great life? The answer is real simple. Stay in the game long enough so that when everybody else has gone home and there's only 8% of you left, right, trying to get the business and 60% of the customers are ready to buy, that you're there and that you're reaping the benefits of persistence. Now, here's the thing. As we get close to our wrap-up with our time with you this morning, and before we um, jump into some uh, Q&A here for a little bit, uh, we thought it would be kind of an interesting idea if we were to share with you um, what we call the five failure levels. Yeah, so for those of you who've read the book, you've seen these, so we wanted to just share them with you again and, and kind of go through them. It's a great way to, to have an overview about failure and how you can move through these levels. So level one's the ability to fail. Easy. We all have it. Um, we don't, unfortunately, move. Many people don't move to the next level, but it's where everybody starts. Level two is the willingness to fail. Um, basically, level two people are people who are willing to fail. They're not, you know, they don't enjoy it all that much, but they're willing to do it if that's what it takes to be successful. And that takes us then to level three, which is really the most interesting of them to us, which is the wantingness to fail. Not the willingness, but the wantingness. Um, you know, truth be told, when I first started in business, I didn't want to fail. When Harold introduced the idea to me, I got it, but I didn't really love the failing. But after a while, I realized that that was how I was going to live the life that I wanted. And the truth is that probably fewer than 5% of, of people get to level three for any sustained period. But when you do get to level three, when you find yourself going to bed at night saying, wow, I didn't get enough no's today, and you're disappointed you're going to find that that is going to make all the difference in the world in terms of your performance. And that kind of leads us to level four, which is what we call failing bigger and failing faster. Right. The people who get to level four have come to the conclusion that if failing is good, then failing faster must be better. It's true. Yep. And not just failing faster, but also bigger. Uh, we like to say a no is a no is a no, no matter who it's coming from. Right. And as the saying goes, easy yeses produce little successes. So when thinking about going for a big no, and when we say big no, we're talking about a scary no. Maybe it's a, a person that you want to approach who you, you think would just be fantastic, but they're a big no. <laughs> um, the real question, the only question should be, do you have something this person might benefit from? And if you believe that you do and you are sold yourself, then put your fear or apprehension aside and just get on with telling them the story. There are probably some people that you haven't approached, that you haven't shared with, haven't asked for whatever reason. Um, just remember a no is a no is a no, no matter who it's coming from. So you know what? When you're trying to get all the no's, you're trying to set those no goals, all of the prejudging that you've had to do in the past to just get those yeses goes out the window, which is fantastic. It has to. Right, and that brings us to level five, which is what we call failing exponentially through others. And really, um, this final level is a function of team leadership. It is what Tupac and Leslie have arranged to have you do today with, with us. Right? Level five people are people who enlist others to fail with them because they understand that if driving your own personal failure rate can increase your personal success, then driving team failure can increase team success. Now, before we do get to the Q&A, though, um, I have to make this point. I have to make this point. We want to impress upon you that staying persistent 
is not just about you and what you get out of the deal. We want to make it very clear that go for no is not to be used as a tool for evil, okay? <laughs> it's not about manipulating people. It's not about badgering people or having people want to run from you. But the reality is, and I think all of you would agree, most people give up way too soon. And staying persistent can be a win-win. So what we're talking about here, and, and if you can take this note down, um, another noteworthy idea is to have a to sell is to serve mindset. The problem is that most people see sales, right? Whether you're selling a, a product, a service, um, people pay to join a business, um, they see that as sales and then they see serving. They see customer service and serving others as choices. It's like an opposite sides of the spectrum where you can only do one or the other. Well, what we're telling you to do is have a servant's mind here. Um, do them simultaneously, and that's part of what Go For No is. It's about serving others. Right, and probably the greatest irony, like as we mentioned earlier, is that when you go for yes is when you pressure people. When you go for no, you're really letting people just you know, hear an offer and make a decision. And so we want you to use it in the right way. And remember that go for no is not just a sales philosophy. It's a life philosophy. Okay, the idea of, of being you know, willing to hear no more often in your life will help you in every area of your life. It doesn't matter whether you're trying to get somebody to join your team or whether you're trying to you know, get a better table in a restaurant. Um, go for no is a concept and a program that, that can help you do that. And so Andrea and I invite you all to start um, what we call living go for no as of today. So with that, we're open for questions. <laughs> Awesome, awesome, uh, Richard and Andrea. Thank you for that. That's truly outstanding. Uh, 